This is The Saucer Life, a podcast in which we examine concepts, events, or people orbiting the world of flying saucers. Few preconceptions, snark when justified, no belief, no debunking. This is George Adamski's Cosmic Philosophy, and we are back. Welcome to the 2022 run of episodes, uh, designated in your podcast app as Season 11, for reasons too boring and arcane to go into here. And if I'm saying it's too boring and arcane... Good gracious. This episode on George Adamski's, I don't know, spiral bound workbook called Cosmic Philosophy and some related materials was prompted by a website comment left by longtime listener Kirk on our episode about Malaysian creatures and Japanese contactees back in October of last year. Kirk asked the following. I'm intrigued by the testimony that Adamski believers in Japan achieved some measure of realization or enlightenment through his philosophical teachings. Recent Western philosophy is mostly analytical and usually lacks a practical component. But I've been reading about the ancient philosophies of Neoplatonism and Stoicism, which had a different character. They both aimed at learning how to live better lives, and Neoplatonism in particular aimed for personal transcendence. Did Adamski himself teach a practical philosophy for achieving enlightenment? Or did his Japanese believers extrapolate such a philosophy independently? And the answer is yes. Yes, he did. And here it is. Um, George Adamski's Cosmic Philosophy. So... This really goes back to the concept of George Adamski's Get Acquainted program, his organization that sort of bound his followers together in a sort of universal club. It begins in 1957, and by this point, Adamski had published two books, had toured around the United States, and was one of dozens of contactees on the scene. And To strengthen the spread of his message, he initiated this Get Acquainted program. And you can hear a little more about how that worked and how it looked in that episode we did uh, involving the Japanese contactees and Malaysian monsters. Now, it probably won't surprise you to know that the Get Acquainted program was, in fact, a suggestion of the Space Brothers. To help in this movement, they have suggested that I ask the help of one or more men and women in each nation, people who have proven their interest and sincerity. In turn, these leaders will need the cooperation of many others throughout their nation. Those in each locality who have already expressed an interest in our interplanetary visitors are to be made acquainted with one another. Regular group meetings of such friends wherever possible are recommended for discussions and closer friendship toward greater understanding of one another. Adamski also explained a little bit about how these clubs would work on an organizational scale and what they would be doing with each other. Information of the brothers from other worlds with whom I continue having more or less regular meetings will be sent regularly to each national leader who, in turn, will forward it to all of his assistants. They will then pass it on to their associates. The idea is that the citizens of each nation, through these efforts, will grow into closer, united friendship with their countrymen without discrimination or divisions of any kind. In time, is hoped that these national efforts will overflow into worldwide understanding and friendship. Suggestions will also be made monthly for individual study and efforts toward a greater understanding of oneself, his purpose of being, his relationship to his fellow man, and his place in the cosmos, of which we are all citizens. In his initial letter to followers about the Get Acquainted program, Adamski outlined a bit of the overall philosophy that he had, that came from the Space Brothers in a way that was more detailed than what comes across in his more straightforward flying saucer materials. The intelligence, father creative principle, and the receptive mother principle of matter are present in every form. All forms must breathe, even the rocks and the grain of sand, 
and that breath is received from the Cosmic Father intelligence, so you can see that all life is interrelated. The full, rich expressions of our unlimited heritage is the birthright of every man, woman, and child, and every living thing. The visitors from the sister planets of our solar system endeavor to live in the constant awareness of this birthright. They will recognize the symbols used by you, and they will know also if you sincerely desire to understand more about your cosmic home and to live in the fullness of life for which you were created. But it's difficult for us to accomplish this. It's difficult for us to, as humans, understand all this because we are trapped in old habits of thought and action and what we can experience directly, as Adamski goes on to explain. Our old thought habits try to keep our conscious thoughts enslaved within the world of effects, that which we can see, hear, smell, and taste. So we must be on constant guard and insist that our mortal mind be aware at all times of its cosmic unity and dependence upon all other forms. Thereby, a respect toward all alike becomes a habit. This attitude will in time replace the judgments, condemnations, greed, and selfishness that we waste so much time and energy in expressing today. This initial letter also provided some guidelines and reiterated that the Space Brothers had followed a similar path on their journey toward enlightenment. First, you should have in mind that all form life, regardless of how high or low it may be privileged to serve, is the expression of its cosmic origin. Second, you should look upon all creation and treat it as you would like to be treated, for all creation embodies the cause, the father-mother principle. Third, look upon all form creation as an effect of a cause. Learn to see the effect and the cause at the same time, not separate as before. No effect can manifest without the cause that supports it. We in the human family have been seeing the effect which is the form, hardly ever seeing the cause that produces the effect. There is a service you may render to mankind by becoming a living example of your cosmic birthright. Then others will want to know what you have, and in time this will become worldwide knowledge. We, the generations to come, can enjoy the fruits of our efforts, and the people of Earth will live the type of life they were intended to have. Now, when you joined the Get Acquainted program, you received a letter that had a symbol on it. And it's the same symbol you see on the podcast app for, or the podcast art for this episode in your podcast app. And to me, it just looks like a couple little squiggles, maybe an R with a G and maybe a little O somewhere. But this symbol was given to George Adamski by his Venusian friends and, quote, represents the fraternity of cosmic sons and daughters. And when you joined, you got a letter, apparently, from what I understand, that explained what this fraternity was and what this symbol is. By acknowledging and using this symbol, you consciously acknowledge to your Earth self your sincere intention to try and understand the cosmic principles of life and to live as a son or a daughter of the cosmic family, recognizing the cosmic father-mother origin of which you are a child, as is all of creation in the cosmos. Now, the symbols themselves are supposedly of cosmic nature and are recognized, quote, by consciously alerted individuals, whether of this or of other worlds. There's one symbol, the first one, it looks like an R to me, depicts the creative father principle. The second picture, which also looks kind of like an R to me, represents the mother principle. So we've seen this father mother principle thing in Adamski's philosophical writings. And I should say at this point that there are more writings than just the cosmic philosophy book that we're going to look at. And the reason I'm enlarging this to looking at some other works is because if we stuck to just cosmic philosophy, it would get really kind of tedious. You're going to see why as we get into some of his, some of his works. But going on with this symbol for the Get Acquainted program and the fraternity of cosmic sons and daughters... It goes on in this letter, this introductory letter, to talk about the father principle and the mother principle, and it it just it keeps going, and it's very much um, repeats a lot of the things we've said. There are some Bible verses that are sort of looked at from an angle to represent what Adamski says. Uh, we'll see that a lot in these philosophical things, 
But overall, it's kind of interesting, and I like that they had a logo. Now, the place where I've found this material about the Get Acquainted program is at a website on the George Adamski case. It is exhaustive. It might be the most exhaustive George Adamski website I've seen so far. It's based in the Netherlands, and the address, and I've put a link in the show notes because this address, it's, it's one of those addresses where you wonder why they did it this way, but this is the way they did it. It's the hyphen Adamski case hyphen no wait I did that wrong this is why I'm putting a link in the show notes but I'm going to try to get this right it's the hyphen Adamski hyphen case dot nl so it has extensive background on the get acquainted program a lot of really good Adamski information if you are into this sort of thing and the creators of the site draw some parallels between the philosophy expressed in this introductory letter and materials from the Get Acquainted program that we've been looking at, and the friendship case, the famous friendship case of uh, a contactee thing that began in Italy in the mid-1950s, which also, quote, gathered a small group of enlightened people to train them so they could behave as trainers to their fellows to change our attitudes over time. We'll be looking at the friendship case at some point on the show, I'm almost certain. So before we get into Cosmic Philosophy, the book itself, let's look at an earlier work of Adamski's called Telepathy, the Cosmic or Universal Language. This came out in 1958, and it is online. The text of it is online. I will put a link in the show notes. The only problem with the online text that I've found, and it was linked through this Dutch site, is that it is to the adamski.jp, um, George Adamski Get Acquainted Program Japan site. And that's not a problem, except for the fact that I think the copy, the way I understand what I'm reading on the website, the copy of the Adamski works that are on this website were translated into Japanese for the website. And then what I was able to get was the Google translation of the Japanese translation of Adamski's original English. So I'm not entirely positive about a lot of things about this. I'm not super, you know, confident about what I'm seeing. But the nice thing is that at the very least, the forward of this book is a a, I was going to say a screenshot because it's the 21st century, but it's a photograph of the original printed page where Adamski tells us a little bit about what he thinks telepathy is. Telepathy is the natural ability inherent within all forms of life to communicate their feelings to all other forms. Nature responds unquestioningly to this law, and each element gives freely of itself to bring forth as a united whole the fruition of manifestation. Man is a thought in action. However, through his limited understanding, he has caused the distortions which have resulted in the chaos he finds around him today. Man has the tools with which to work, but he has lost his awareness of their ability to serve him in the greater field of selfless self-expression. His capacity to process and expand his thoughts from the coarser to the finer expressions could be likened to a kaleidoscope containing a sphere, a triangle, and a square. Each turn of the kaleidoscope produces a new pattern, no two alike. When man expands his awareness to a oneness with the cosmos, the same law of diversity in an ever-changing, growing pattern will give him the fullness of life. To attain his goal, he must understand that touch is a nerve reaction, while feeling is a state of alertness. The state of true alertness is a conscious consciousness, which is all-inclusive cosmic knowledge. So some things about this that are interesting. So this telepathy thing, telepathy thing, this telepathy booklet that Adamski has written is basically in a lot of ways a rough draft for the cosmic philosophy book. So that's that's one thing. He we have reiterations of the same ideas. And the other thing is out of those same ideas, these notions of life in the universe all being unified and coming to terms with the fact that we are part of a cosmic consciousness and the father principle and the mother principle and all living things being unified together. 
that's basically the core of cosmic philosophy. And it's not really a lot of substance to fill these books up. Another thing is that I reloaded this page at the Adamski.jp website. And what's really neat is, and I didn't notice this before, is that in addition to the Google translated Japanese translation of Adamski's book, all the pages have the text, um, the photograph of the text in English. So we can see how the translation was different, which might not be interesting to you, but is interesting to me. So if we look at the first book or the first chapter of his telepathy book, which is called Telepathy, the Cosmic Language, the original English says this, quote, upon the bookshelves of the scientific mind, neatly labeled and dated with methodical accuracy are arranged innumerable recognized but unsolved riddles of life. From time to time, an inquiring mind will unshelf a volume from the dusty archives and bring it to the attention of his colleagues, end quote. Now, the retranslation says, quote, the bookshelf entitled The Mind of Science is an orderly collection of books on the mysteries of life that are known but still unsolved. Upon the books of the scientific mind, neatly labeled and dated with methodical accuracy, are arranged innumerable recognized but unsolved riddles of life. Occasionally, an inquisitive person simply takes out a volume of a dusty old record and draws the attention of his peers. From time to time, an inquiring mind will unshelf a volume from the dusty archives and bring it to the attention of his colleagues. It's weird the way it's written. I'm not going to do this for every page. I just think it's kind of interesting to do it now. So if we look at the chapters and the, the sections of the telepathy book, mental telepathy is the common language of all. Telepathy is one of the laws of nature. Human beings have the best understanding. There's a big difference between aliens and earthlings. Oh, I wonder what that could be. I haven't clicked on this yet. You're sort of experiencing some of this with me, um, which is a different way, a way I've never done this, but I think it's going to be interesting. So let's, let's do a quiz. Part one, chapter one, there is a big difference between aliens and earthlings. Let's predict what it's going to be, what that difference is going to be. I'm going to say the difference is that the aliens have a fuller understanding of of the cosmic language and of the oneness of all things. So now let's figure that out and see if I'm right and play along at home. If you have a guess, let's see if you're right. The more highly developed space people have learned that in its natural state, all life expresses as a joyous free execution of each action. They do not consider the performance of their daily chores burdensome, but rather view them as a privilege whereby they can render further service to cosmic cause by enabling it to ex express unhampered through them. They are trained from infancy in the proper care of their bodies and use of their minds. They will not harbor a discordant thought, for they know what it does to the chemicals of the body. Their sense mind is coordinated with the feeling or cause mind, so each individual cell of the body responds to the commands given by the sense mind. By use of this law, their bodies remain firm and youthful regardless of age. They know that all life is constantly active, and that each particle of creation performs its duty in a free, unimpeded expression of cause. Okay, I don't think I did well on that one. I, uh, I went with a little cynical, a little, oh, it's about the whole universe being connected sort of thing, and it was a little more specific than that. So more about how action can be translated from the mind, right? We heard that, that, and that's not what I said. So I think as far as my prediction of what the difference between humans and aliens would be, I'm going to give myself, ah, I'm going to give myself a C minus on that because I think some of those elements were there, but I think I was off the mark in some ways. There's another section that looks interesting in chapter two, and that is telepathic phenomenon between humans and and inanimate objects. So the old idea of, of, why did I say it like that, of psychometry that we talked about in an episode, oh, a ways back, a few years back. So let's see what George has to say about humans and telepathy and just stuff that's sitting around. 
Another good example of telepathic exchange between humans and inanimate nature can be found in people who possess what we call a green thumb. Everything grows abundantly for them, for while they are planting, they unconsciously commune with the soil and the seedlings. You will notice these people know each plant intimately, pointing with pride to those which are thriving and feeling concern for the plight of the sickly. Though the person is not aware of using telepathy in this instance, the inanimate manifestations of the plant world definitely respond to the love pouring out from the mind of the individual. This phase of telepathy is little understood and almost never used consciously by earthlings, for its application calls for a thorough knowledge of man's unity with nature. It is just as easy to exchange mental impressions with plants, vegetable, trees, minerals, etc., as it is with another human being. All right, so I think I am going to call a foul here because when I think of things that are inanimate, plants are not something that spring readily to mind. Uh, uh, inanimate means not, I mean, not moving, but not living. It's not a, a living thing, and plants are living things. Now, when he says soil, yeah, I mean, yeah, okay, soil is an inanimate object, but the seedlings? No. But I will um, be very excited to inform the saucer wife that she is engaging in telepathy with her plants when we end up with way more tomatoes than we could possibly use during the summer. Okay, I think we'll do one more from the telepathy book or the book, let me make sure I have the title, Telepathy, the Cosmic or Universal Language. And just looking down the list of topics, I think, oh... The horror of regret. The horror of regret. I think that is a, a good thing to end on. Who hasn't had the horror of regret? Right now, you're regretting hitting play on this podcast episode. But I'm having too much fun just poking around different corners of the Adamski philosophy. So the horror of regret. Here we go. While we are discussing these undesirable emotions which play such havoc with our minds and bodies it would be well to point out the danger of holding a grudge. When we nurse thoughts of hatred, feeding them constantly in our desire for revenge, we are poisoning our minds and our bodies as surely as if we are taking a noxious drug by mouth. The target of our hatred may be totally unaware of our attitude, or if he is aware, he can turn these thoughts aside by refusing to allow them entry. In other words, he can recognize our mental immaturity and not accept these derogatory thought vibrations from us. This adds frustration to our hatred and causes us still more harm. So it is apparent that we alone suffer in these circumstances, and if prolonged, nature will exact a terrible price. Because we not only keep the atmosphere immediately surrounding us polluted with our discordant thought vibrations, which will eventually alienate us from our friends, but all the while we are inexorably poisoning our physical bodies. See, here's, here's my thing with... Adamski's philosophy. This is sort of the cosmic wisdom that has been brought to him by the Space Brothers, but this is just common sense. This is just being a grown-up and realizing that that holding grudges and, and being vindictive is is not a good thing. I mean, do you really need the space people to tell you that? I mean, people have told us that for a long time. Of course, it hasn't sunk in for me because I am a white hot seething ball of rage sometimes. But I think this is a good place to take a break so I can settle down a little bit and then we can move into another one of the several volumes that make up George Adamski's collected body of philosophical work. <laughs> Next time, we are going almost as far from the sweetness and light and, hey, don't hold a grudge stuff that characterize Adamski's philosophical meanderings because we are looking at a book by Helmut Lammer and Marion Lammer called Milabs, Military Mind Control and Abduction. And this is another sort of listener request episode uh, that I'm honoring because the listener in question sent me a copy of this very difficult to get and kind of expensive book. And I really appreciate it. And he said, I'll get you the book if you do an episode on it. So military mind control and alien abductions. We've seen a little bit of this in our episode on the essay, the controllers and our episodes on the 
books and life and experiences of abductee Leah Haley that we've done in the last couple of years. So really excited about this episode. And it's one of those topics that is um, relentlessly grim. So the next thing is something that we're kind of excited about here and a a little nervous about, I'm not going to lie, but on February 1st, we are going to be launching the Chizo Media Patreon. Um, This this is going to be a a joint effort uh, with The Saucer Life and our sister show, Great Lakes Lore, that I host with Samantha Engel on alternate Mondays and our shows on Saucer Life here is on alternate Fridays. And it's just a way a lot of people have contributed over the years to the show, some recurring month to month. And this is a way for me to have a structured way to provide some sort of material benefit to people who provide me with material benefit and provide Chizo Records with, or Chizo Records, we haven't been Chizo Records since 1998, Chizo Media with the ability to not only do this show, but some headspace to try another show out and to, to work on another show and to do do something a little bit different with Great Lakes Lore. And so that's February 1st. I'll be telling you more about it, but um, it, it's going to be it's going to be fun. And there's some things that I've wanted to do, sort of bonusy things that I've wanted to do that I haven't really figured out a good way to do. And I think this might be a good way to do it. Um, so if you've been supporting us all along, that's This is a different way to do it, which will provide some benefit. If you haven't been able to support us, maybe you'll be able to do it, uh, to do it through this way. It's something we're trying and it's something where we're excited about. And I want to make sure that you know that nothing about the show as you have received it for the last four and a half years is going to change. It's going to be every other week a episode like we've always had, whether you like that or not is is a different question. And on off weeks, I, I think at this point I'm still going to do the listener feedback sort of saucer afterlife thing. It started in 2020 when I had a little more time on my hands and I'll, I'll see how it goes, but, um, I'm not planning on changing anything about the show. Um, if you don't subscribe, the only thing that will be different is on episodes during this middle break thing, I will be telling you what's been happening over at the Patreon. That's really going to be the only difference. Um, I am actually turning red and blushing and feel uncomfortable talking about it right now. I would do terrible in sales. So I'm going to just segue to saying that you can check out past episodes of the show at saucerlife.com. And we're always on Twitter and Instagram at saucerlife. And you can email us at thesaucerlife at gmail.com. Our mailing address is Chizo Media, P.O. Box 68, Grand Blanc, Michigan, 48480. And now, let's get back to philosophy class. Before we get back into the actual texts of the Adamski scriptures, I don't know how else to say it, I thought it would be interesting to take a look at how this was pitched to an actual group, the sort of beginnings of what might have been a get acquainted group. This is the introduction to a speech by Adamski about the science of life, which is another one of his philosophical guidebooks that he wrote from 1960, 1961. I'm not clear on who it is talking. There was no name attached to it. This is from the Wendy Connors collection that has been floating around and is up on archive.org, I believe still, but it's in 1960 or 1961 and the place Dorchester was mentioned. So I think this is somewhere in Massachusetts, but this is somebody introducing George Adamski to talk to their group and talking about what they can learn and what they materials they have available. And Adamski gives a whole speech afterward, but I really, for some reason, this introduction sort of was more interesting to me than Adamski's actual speech, because what we hear 
are the words of somebody who believed George Adamski and thought these books were just brilliant and life-changing. And I find that perspective way more fascinating than the words of the guy who was selling the books. I don't know why, but I just, the same reason I think books written by fans about what they love are sometimes more interesting than the things they love themselves, if that makes sense. But here is anonymous Adamski introducer from somewhere in Massachusetts, I think. If we start a group here, uh, it will be patterned after Mr. Adamski's work and these teachings that the brothers are giving him. We have, uh, there are uh, three little booklets at the moment, which uh, after a while Mr. Adamski is trying to put into one book. This is uh, Telepathy, the Language of the Universe. Uh, it's a basic understanding of uh, yourself, what makes you tick, why we're here, and uh, I find it very helpful in the short time that I've been using it. And we will use this material, the cosmic philosophy, I don't know whether all of you have seen this or not, we have a few of them left here, they're not available in the bookstores, you have to send to California to get, get it from Mr. Adamski, so we brought some with us in case anyone would like to have one. Then currently, Mr. Adamski has a series of 12 lessons going called Science of Life. This would probably be the name of our group, a Science of Life study group. And this is, uh, you start with the telepathy book list, go into the cosmic philosophy, and then the Science of Life is still deeper phase of this work. And it's pure science and truth. It has nothing to do with religion or metaphysics or uh, occult uh, things, anything of this nature that we most of us have studied into in varying degrees before. It's, it's mostly just scientific fact. This is why it appeals to me. It's just plain common sense, and it fits together like pieces in a picture puzzle. And uh, it, it, to me, it's just fantastic. <laughs> I don't know how I ever lived about it, really. <laughs> so I, uh, I hope you will ask Mr. Adamski questions. I don't know what he's going to tell you. Uh, Sunday night when we had this meeting in Dorchester, I didn't know what he would say either, and I left him to say all of these things, and he didn't. So tonight I thought I would, and then people would understand more where, where they are to begin with, and you can fit in better what he's trying to tell you. And if you have any questions, I know you'll be glad to answer them. All right. So the sound quality wasn't great, but it's like 60 years old. So, hey, it's not bad. And I'm not an expert audio engineer. So, hey, it's not bad. But some of the things I thought were interesting there, actually, one thing I thought was interesting more than anything else was her emphatic emphatic insistence that nothing Adamski was talking about was anything other than, in quotes, science. This is not religion. This is not belief. This is the science of life. This is provable, evidence-based stuff. And, you know, it kind of isn't. But I think it's interesting that that was something that this speaker thought was important to emphasize. So at this point, let's look at the Cosmic Philosophy booklet itself. It's a little under 100 pages, eight and a half by 11, spiral bound. There are copies out there on the internet if you want to find it. And if we look at the table of contents, we have definition of cosmic philosophy, the truth about truth, perception and conception. What is consciousness? Conscious and subconscious minds. Man is a four-sense being. We're going to come back to that one. The highway of progress, faith, to be born again, emotional balance, free will or self-hypnotism, relaxation, the language of the cosmos, the chemical universe, ancient wisdom or modern progress, past civilizations, the parable of the apple tree. A lot of thinky and pseudo-thinky kind of things there. But let's start with the preface, which is this definition of cosmic philosophy. Cosmic philosophy embraces the universe conceived as an orderly and harmonious system complete in itself. 
our present perception of mind and matter must be expanded to the realm of cause in order to understand and take our place in the classroom of everlasting learning. Observation is our greatest teacher, but we must learn to see the cause or the related purpose in all forms or manifestations. Principle or source of origin and nature's laws remain forever the same for they are immutable. Man's concept of the law expands as he desires to know more and more about his purpose in relation to the cosmos. So there are some standard Adamski things here. The, the biggest sort of standard Adamski thing, I think, is this relationship or this comparison of development and learning to a classroom. From the very beginnings of Adamski's writings about the Space Brothers, he considers the Earth a cosmic kindergarten. We're the ones at the bottom of the hierarchy, and we are going to earn our way up and learn our way up as you do from one grade to the next, learning things and having more skills. So it should not, sort of in that same vein, be very surprising that Earth humans are late to the party on figuring all of this cosmic philosophy stuff out. Our neighbors on the sister planets of our solar system came to the realization a long time ago that every minutest particle in the cosmos is interrelated with every other particle. Thereby, in order to have even a small perception of the purpose of life, each phase must be studied in relation to the whole. They shared a theory with all who were interested, and gradually theories grew into facts as they explored further and further and unified all life. A humble reverence and love for the all-knowing intelligence as it expressed in every living form became their inspiration. Human relationship and behaviorism was taught to their children to aid them in individual expression of their own divinity. The following lessons I humbly present with the hope that they may act as stepping stones in your quest for knowledge. That's all very similar to the things he says in his books, particularly inside the spaceship, which is where a lot of his philosophy comes out. So moving past the preface into the introduction, why do you need both? Anyway, this is the truth about truth, which is great because I'd love to know the truth about truth. And, and if we could get the truth about the truth, which is about the truth, then we could just keep going forever. Many generations ago, when the Roman Empire was at the height of her glory and the weight of her dominance was felt by a host of people, there arose in her midst a master mind who said to those oppressed, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And the people, eager for deliverance, cried out, The truth! Give us the truth that we may be free! They were told the meaning of the truth, but they could not comprehend. And so we hear the echo of those words and of the billions like them quivering down the ages with an insistent appeal. The truth. What is truth? And so here, quivering down the ages, we get the first of many, many reinterpretations of bits and pieces of Christian notions, quotations, and tropes blended with Adamski's Space Brother talk and other portions that are a great deal of pseudo-philosophical double talk like this. Let us, therefore, get down to real analysis. Just what is the truth about truth? You have said that it is reality, and if I were to ask you to define reality, you would be compelled to admit that it is that which has actual existence, and yet you speak of the real and the unreal. You have a set standard for reality. Does not everything that is known have apparent existence? How else should it have become known? You know how, like, everything that's real exists and stuff that isn't real doesn't exist? Isn't that wild? I mean, how do we even know if stuff is real unless it exists? I'm having flashbacks to college intro philosophy class here. These are... This is... The no snark thing is, is not going to last through this. And this is why we're not covering all of the cosmic philosophy book in depth, because as I got into this, it was just this sort of meandering kind of self-indulgent paragraph you just heard. That's the whole book. It's just wow. So what's the answer, George? Please. I am getting tired. What is the truth? Truth, he says, 
is action. Quote, the whole action of which every part is true. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And the truth is that all things are true, true in a relative sense, I grant you, relative to all other parts. But until men recognize and give due consideration to the cause of all actions, they will never be free. Only in uniting our efforts, acknowledging a common purpose, can we bring civilization to a unified state of understanding and progress. So, (laughs) I don't even know. I don't even know how to understand this. It seems brilliant and deep, but at the same time, when you try to think through and like diagram these sentences, there's not a lot there. Kirk asked in his comment back in the fall about whether or not Adamski had an originally developed philosophy of his own or if people sort of read into it. And what we see here is that he had something of his own, yes, but I mean, to my mind, it's shallow and it's repetitive. This keeps going on and on and on. And I've got to be honest, I almost did not do this episode. I am doing this episode. This episode comes out on Friday, January 14th, I think, January 14th. I am now recording this as I speak at 12.08 a.m. Friday, January 14th, because as I worked on this and as I reread through these things over and over, I was just like, this is so dull. This is so deathly dull, and I don't know if I can make something useful out of it. And I just announced the whole Patreon thing, and what I've got to work with is George Adamski's cosmic philosophy. Kirk, what have you done? Um, actually, it's, it's it's my fault for saying, hey, that sounds like a great idea before I actually read Cosmic Philosophy. So this is the first time this has actually happened, which given some of the topics that I've covered is is kind of surprising. But this is the first time when as I am working on the episode and even as I am starting to record on what was now yesterday, I get to a point where I'm like, I don't think this works. I can't make this any better. Um, But there's one more thing in this cosmic philosophy booklet that I want to look at. And that is a chapter, the chapter called man is a four sense being because I was always taught growing up in science class that humans had five senses, sight, taste, smell, hearing, and touch. I mean, and those all seem like valid things. So if man is a four sense being, which one is fake? Well, it's touch or feeling. That's right. Not a real sense, not a thing. George explains why. But let us now remove that which is known as the fifth sense. Let us deprive man of feeling. What is the immediate result? The result is a state of unconsciousness. The four other senses have ceased to function, even though the organs of sense themselves are still existing in the body. The eyes, nose, palate, and ears are uninjured, yet they do not see, smell, taste, or hear. Apparently, these senses cannot, then, work independently of feeling. Does this not prove that feeling is not a sense, but the conscious power that gives sensation to the senses? So let's get this straight. Sense or feeling is not one of quote, the senses, because without sense or feeling, none of the other senses would work. Why is this even, why is this even an issue? Oh my gosh. You know what I'm doing? You know what I'm going to do right now? I've never done this. I am done. I have never had a topic or a set of documents annoy me so much as George Adamski's explanation for why man only has four senses and not five. Never before have I thought to myself while recording, perhaps, just perhaps, I should have done an episode about UFO disclosure, Lou Elizondo, and whatever acronym agency is currently looking at things in the sky, 
secretly over at the Pentagon. It's rock bottom, folks. But there's George Adamski's cosmic philosophy. So if you've ever wanted to know what Adamski talked about on all of these tours and his world tours, when, when he runs out of stories about how he went on the Space Brothers ship, what does he talk about? Why is Adamski still a figure that people pay attention to? You can buy this book from the George Adamski Foundation right now. And it's fascinating to me because it has very little of the depth that something like the philosophy of George King and the Aetherius Society would have. And I don't know, it just, it bugs me somehow. This whole thing has bugged me somehow. But I'm going to calm down. I'm going to follow the advice of the space brothers and sisters and not hold a grudge. And I'm going to move gracefully to the closing of the episode. Thank you for listening. If you've hung in here till the end, remember to send in your questions and comments, complaints via the usual social media or email channels, and we'll address it on our feedback episode next week. The associate producer of The Saucer Life is Simpson J. Hanover III, but not on this one because he's not getting to listen to it and give feedback before it goes out because it is now 12.17 a.m. The Saucer Life is a production of Chizo Media, LLC. Chizo Media, our heart is with the people. Until next time, keep watching the skies because the skies are watching you. <laughs>